Yes, Amos, please. To add to what has been said, I think we need to engage this requirement of practice, but also, I mean, have a strong technical support because some of the some of the community of practice are experts in their field, but they are not experts in the infrastructure we are creating. So the strong technical support is something which also will create, I mean, the ownership which is required by those community of practice, I mean, to own the infrastructure that we are creating for them. So I mean, they can, can continue using it. Okay, thanks a lot, expert technical support. I, I guess that is uh, important for all of us. We are going to put this to the audience for some time, and, and I'm going to be provocative here and challenge people who can be scientifically demonstrated to come from the African continent, and I can do that by looking at you. Most of us sitting on this stage are from outside Africa. Do we know what we are talking about? Have we got the issues? Well, Vincent is from Africa, right? Yes, an Italian from Egypt in Africa. Yes. Can we get some comments? Is what we are saying right? The issues which have come out are these the sustainability issues for communities of practice on the continent? Yes, the lady from Zimbabwe. Uh, please make it uh, brief. Sure. Thank okay. You. Thank you very much. Um, I have so much, uh, so many showers of praises for ICT, and the beauty of ICT cannot be underestimated. But when we are thinking ICT, are we looking at all parameters? Uh, there is a country that required manpower, and they said, let's reproduce at a faster rate. In no time, the population was uh, so huge that they had to resort to trimming down, to cut down on the number of uh, children the, uh, the, the uh, people could have. Now, with the issue of ICT, are we not going to end up with a one Simon Taylor beaming lectures to the whole world and the computer marking all the tests and everyone else with no job. Thank you. Uh, Bubaka is, is wisely leaving this to me. Or I don't know that it's wise or maliciously. Are we going to have one Simon Taylor? In other words, um, are we creating the local expertise and skills within Africa? Are we localizing this? Is that really the key issue? Or put another way, can we ensure that we don't need Simon Taylor beyond the next month and so on? I, I think that's where the issue we must put ourselves. Uh, thanks a lot. Simon Taylor, you are safe for the time being. Yes, there was another comment. I saw a hand up here, please. And then... Uh, thank you. My name is... Please introduce yourselves, please. Uh, my name is Dimitri Martinez. I'm from a company called MCM Digital in South Africa. Um, the discussion uh, on the in infrastructures has focused very much on research. Um, and I wanted to, to hear perhaps some views about what about the development of the ICT sectors the, as an economic activity in, in different African countries, uh, the development of ICT entrepreneurs and enterprises. Um, I wrote my question before Vincenzo uh, made his comments, but I still think uh, it, it applies. Um, uh, so, so that's the, the, the question. Uh, the, the comment is, I suspect it has to do with the view that, that ICT is a luxury or it's the domain of um, academics or elites rather than critical infrastructure like roads and water. Um, you, often you'll hear the argument, um, oh no, we can't spend on expanding ICT, whether it's radio, television, broadband. We need water uh, before we can do that. We need... So um, is there a way we can shift this way of thinking to, that it's not just about, first of all, an elite, um, but, but also that it's not only about research, it's also about an economic and developing uh, African economies um, and the ICT sectors in those economies? Thank you. you know, thank you very much. I, I think this is uh, very, very important. And uh, uh, it's true that we also have to think of uh, ICT, you know, as, a, as as a business. You know how we can develop it. Uh, what are the the incentives? You know how to promote 
you know, uh, ICT entrepreneurs, et cetera, in Africa. I think this is something very important. So the questions and, I mean, uh, the discussion and the question posed are not only for the panelists. I mean, if there are any, you know, contribution from the audience, they are very most welcome. But now we are, uh, we'll come back to the panelists and uh, let us give the chance to the audience to make contribution first. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, the discussions are extremely stimulating. And uh, here I just wished to give uh, my opinion uh, regarding the, the future uh, of this uh, infrastructure. Uh, for the sustainability purposes, uh, one, I feel that uh, there should be a level of empowering the researchers and uh, uh, the, all those that would use the infrastructure to be able to have the ability to, to handle the e infrastructure technology so that later on they can be able to, to translate them to their local uh, needs apply them to their, their local situations, uh, which uh, in some cases, giving awareness is good, but if it's not handed down to the hands of those who would need to solve their, their problems, tell them to their, to their situations, use them to develop their homegrown solutions, uh, sustainability would still be a, a big problem. And another one, uh, would be, I think, more on the political uh, front. Because uh, I like the model of Europe, because you find that Europe today would seem like one country, yet there are so many countries. But in Africa, even the neighboring countries can be so distant from each other in a number of ways. And so if the, uh, this uh, continues to persist, and the, 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 the potential uh, users of this infrastructure uh, technologies don't have easy synergies, then probably it would still be a problem if they remain as discrete elements uh, in Africa. So, but I think probably this platform would not be able to solve this problem, but at the African Union level, there should be uh, a drive to pull down all the dividing walls, both in terms of the infrastructure, but in other ways, so that Africa seems to be like one country as it is in Europe today, so that, I'm finishing, sir. So, so that uh, the, 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 the synergy that you would generate from this Africa alone would be able to help it uh, be self-sustaining, in, in, especially in the area of research, to be able to know what is being done in the neighboring and uh, neighboring village in terms of countries. Thank you. Sir. Thank you very much. Can you introduce yourself again? Oh, sorry, I am Ngarambe Donat. I'm from the University of Rwanda in Rwanda. Okay. Thank, thank you very much. I think uh, a couple of issues have been uh, raised here. I mean, for the panelists, but also for the for the audience. You know, we talk about uh, empowerment. I'm sure you are talking certainly about uh, capacity building and mastering, you know, these technologies. Spoke about, you know, another point on localization, you know, taking into account the local needs, you know, so that we can adapt these uh, technologies. And on the, at the political front, maybe Edmond will have a, a comment on that, you know, the role of the uh, African Union. You know, we are talking here about integration and being not only at regional level, maybe even at continental level. Uh, we'll come back to that. Uh, mm, I, I mean, could, Colette? Thanks. Uh, I just wanted to find out in this uh, e Africa uh, where, the, where the role for uh, telecommunication companies Ah, do they are we interfacing with them somewhere? Because they, in terms of sustain, sustainability, they can benefit or they can actually 
ensure sustainability because they would also derive profits from this connectivity. Thank you. Okay, can panelists please note that question? Now that somebody in the audience has got an answer, there's a red at the back and then we shall come to Karin. Mine is not a question, but rather a comment that since we have already have the, some projects, e, e infrastructure projects going on, like the one with the Bunda, if those projects are successful, then even the government official policy makers, it will be easy for them to see that this thing is working. So even the funding issues, they can help on funding. I think the success of the ongoing projects will be an issue to serve. OK, thanks a lot for that. Uh, before we go to, we are going to have Isaac get his hand up, and then shall come to Karin. And then shall come back there if there's an answer. The, the question raised, I think, relates to what our colleague said earlier on, our colleague from Tanzania, that is a politician, he wants results. And uh, we are talking about showing real success. That can be understood in the different countries so that they can then be demonstrators for the rest. Let's hear from Isaac, please. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I really draw this. Uh, on sustainability from the experience we had with the rural communication development. I feel that when you have very small levies which are targeted to a particular sector on particular products which benefit from what you're doing, those small levies can be used to finance that bridging arrangement until it reaches the stage of where people can make money from it. So if we had, for example, a 0.5% levy on, let's say, medicine or things which we know would benefit from this, and we target that revenue to support the initiative until it reaches sustainability. Okay, so thanks a lot, Isaac. I, I think we'll take that back to the politicians too. Maybe you might want to think about what guarantees you have that once it is in the central pool, it will not end up buying some executive jet for the president or something like that. Yes, please, Karin. Yeah, thank you, Tusu. We, uh, <coughs> we didn't say much about the um, emerging business models and public-private partnerships, so I would be very happy to hear about the uh, panelist opinion about this, because um, in terms of sustainability, it's, uh, to me, it's very important. Okay, the issue of private-public partnerships and other partnerships which can lead to sustainability. I think we shall put it back to the panel for a while. And then after that, okay, there was a hand at the back, there was a red at the back. Let's take that one first, please. And then we'll bring it. Or oh, is it a gentleman? A gentleman sitting next to the ladies. I'm sorry, I couldn't quite see you. Yes, uh, Joseph Nyaga from uh, uh, ICRI of KU Leuven. I'm also from Kenya. And um, I'm working on a, a East African community. And uh, I'm wondering, with these results, eventually to have uh, implementation of the results of the projects and uh, all these uh, kind of things we are talking about here. We have we'll have to sell the the results of the of the project to the poli policy makers. I'm wondering if you are also focusing on the policy effects uh, of, uh, of, uh, of of the of the impacts uh, uh, of the, of the projects, and also if you are experiencing some kind of policy obstacles between the various member states, because I, I know I'm working on harmonizing policy um, in the East Africa community, which also uh, goes with the regulation and also uh, legislation of uh, the East African community frameworks. Um, if I could hear some comments on this. Thank you very much. Uh, so a uh, couple of issues. You know, uh, I think the first one was about visibility. I mean, if, from what we are doing, it must be known by politicians, especially you know, successes, you know, the results of uh, what's being done, and also the issue of uh, the need of harmonization of policies and, and, and regulation. So let us come back to the, to the panel. Uh, please keep your intervention short. So there are a couple of issues that have been raised, so I hope you have taken note of, the, of them. So if there is anyone who wants to make uh, comments on that, yeah, please. Thank you. So I will come back to the uh, question of the first uh, uh, speaker from, from the the room. Uh, I, I'm glad you stress again the, the necessity to have uh, e-infrastructure uh, as a general facilities and this is what I, I tried to highlight this morning calling that the e-infrastructure commons because it should be as uh, useful uh, as roads or the water. 
Uh, with respect to the entrepreneurship, the, the main difficulty is that currently uh, all the infrastructure we have mentioned are working on NRENs, which are public national research and education network. And most of these NRENs have the policy not authorizing uh, commercial activity on them, not to concurrent uh, the, the private uh, network providers. So this complexifies a bit the panorama. We can have relationship with entrepreneur or company when it, uh, for what concern the R&D for this company. But as soon as they want to sell services, then we have to find another model. So this is maybe where the, the private-public partnership may come, but it, it has also some, some issues, uh, legal, financial, uh, which are not easy to tackle. So the European Commission is uh, starting to launch some program uh, to, to tackle that and to, to find the, the, the right solution. Uh, most of the time it ends up also with a procurement with, which have to be launched by the, the public organization. And so these are a lengthy process. So this, this is not an, an easy area to... And just to, to, to finish on, on the sustainability, the financial sustainability. I think the uh, funding agencies like the European Commission or the African Union Commission can provide only let's say up to 10% of the necessary budget for this infrastructure. And most of the fund has to come also from the national budget. And so this, this is an investment that the country have to make. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Yannick. And uh, yes, uh, I, I just wanted to, to add something to what you said regarding you know, competition, you know, and rents, uh, not competing with pri uh, private sector. I think this is something that is, uh, very important and uh, entrance or rent in general, you are very uh, careful about it, but uh, there is room for collaboration, for cooperation, that's where the PPP comes in. And as Leonardo was saying this morning, you know, uh, NRENs are innovation hubs, you know, and are test beds, you know, for new technologies. I think this is something very important. Simon? Uh, I'd just like to pick up on two points. Um, I have to pick up on me to begin with. So much as I like the idea of me being the single educator for the world, I rather like the idea that through infrastructures we share the best lecturers and their outputs and their materials across universities across the world. So the best African lecturers being able to teach in a European classroom and vice versa. And I think that's sometimes something that is overlooked from e-infrastructures. So part of the AVIST pharmacological network, the, the Science Gateway, some elements of that was a learning portal. And I would really like to see, as the infrastructures get rolled out, a standardized open source learning environment, perhaps Moodle, Blackboard, or wherever, but something that's an off-the-shelf solution, because every university in the world, arguably, is using some kind of variance on that. So let's just use one and share, you know? So not just me, but everybody in the room is sharing their excellent lecturing material with students in their sector. I think that'd be exciting. Going into ICT enterprises, um, I think there's a huge opportunity here. So I've had conversations with several people in the room about the future of cloud computing and cloud computing provision from African countries. So it's obviously in the minds of people. So how can we help those potential providers understand the needs of ICT-based SMEs that are planning to offer software as a service? And there's a real journey and opportunity to leapfrog into a bright cloud-based future if we can make those connections. So we're arguing about how we can move forward on this, but I think, again, planning for the future, putting those sort of sim simpler approaches to using computing resources and having those ready when the infrastructures or private clouds or whatever come online, I think it's a very exciting opportunity. Okay, thanks a lot, Simon. I think, Lars, you had your hand up, then you shall come to the Incenzo, or Enzo. Lars, first, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think it's an important issue, of course, this of uh, partnership. So, uh, of course, there should be private-public partnership, but we shouldn't also, we shouldn't forget about partnership between, for example, universities, and various communities. I think it was a very good example on teaching. We heard from Bunda and Serengeti. And here you can, if you have modern um, e infrastructure, have distance learning and earn money. 
uh, and use resources. And I think people can understand that the politicians. The second example where I think uh, you could uh, gain sustainability through uh, partnerships locally, regionally, is in the area of rational use of medicines. Medicine uh, cover 40 to 60 percent of healthcare cost in most of the African countries. And you have generic <coughs> drugs, sometimes uh, they are faked, but these generic drugs are very cheap and should generally be used. So you can build a system where you can know about the quality of uh, drugs, improve how the drugs is distributed and used, and show that uh, through examples that you can gain money, then I'm sure you can get funding for such experiment. And here I think the um, healthcare scientists and ICTs, uh, scientists together, should have a main role. Okay, thanks a lot, Lars. Uh, before Enzo comes in, you raised the issue of getting funding. Is that a valid statement when we're addressing sustainability? I thought that sustainability looks at funding comes from the value you add internally from within the country. Yes, but I'm, my point is you should have an example. Oh, you should have an example please. and add together how much you can gain from an experiment that perhaps can be then spread. And these two examples, learning, teaching, and use of drugs, distribution of drugs. Okay, thanks, Laz. Uh, as Enzo answers, I'm going to have a question for Amos and Edmund. Please get ready for it. Enzo, please. Um, a couple of interesting issues have been raised. Uh, uh, first one is that whenever uh, there are new emerging technologies, there are better business opportunities for small companies. This is what is happening. Uh, believe it or not, cloud is one of these, and uh, we, we, we strongly benefit uh, and leverage on this. Um, it's happened in the past with any other technology, with mobiles and so on. So if we catch them on time, uh, we can leverage on the, on, on, on the benefit that they can bring. Um, there are uh, a problem I see in our countries is that uh, there is very little relation between uh, R&D and academia and the industry, even less than what you can see in developed countries. And, and sometimes uh, people from, from the academia, they are looking more at replicating what has been done in developed countries than uh, rethinking, as we discussed before, and bringing this, this knowledge, um, uh, leveraging on the differences um, uh, on, on that they are that they have in their own countries. Um, last but not least, uh, there are issues such as open source that has been touched that uh, is not well understood. The potential business opportunity for small companies in emerging countries that open source brings versus commercial solution is huge. And very little effort has been done. Of course, there are many opponents because every money you take, if you invest in open source, most likely you, take, you are taking off the pocket of big names that can advertise pay ticket, uh, tickets for uh, bringing you to events or politicians to events and so on. So it's like an un unpaid uh, fight in David and Goliath. But, uh, mm -hmm. but it, it, we should understand, I mean, not only for uh, you in the academia, uh, you, you may be saving some money by, to, by using all open source, but even most, more important is having business and industry understanding how they can make money of this how they can make more money, and how the money they will make, they will benefit the country if more than anything else. Okay, thanks, and I think the issue also came from our colleague from South Africa about creating development of the ICT sector as an input sustainability and bring the issue of open source software, which I think can be taken on board. I was in Sudan sometime this year, and uh, they're running everything on uh, open source because they're under embargo. Uh, so they have been very fortunate, maybe if you put Africa under the total embargo, it would help a lot, but that might be rather difficult. You also brought in the issue of um, the linkage between industry, universities, academia, which is actually missing as another big opportunity. Now, before we call for voluntary interventions, I've got uh, one question for Amos, which came from the audience, and one for Edmund. Uh, Amos, it actually talks about uh, regional cooperation, yours is very specific. You have got a spa computer. 
in Tanzania. Uh, could you share what kind of capacity of that supercomputer is actually being utilized and the plans for expanding it, if you have the figures? And then Edmund can talk a bit more about how we can bring about regional collaboration, really, in terms of creating synergies between infrastructures. I think that came up from our colleague from Rwanda. If you can get specific comments on those two, we can then open the floor again for the other panelists. Yeah, so how much capacity is being utilized in it, I think is very true. I don't have the specific figures, but the challenge we are having, it was, as I said it before, we didn't have the enough technical support within our community at the GIT in Tanzania to support the end users. There were people who were showing interest, someone doing um, bioinformatics or whatever, but they just are bioinformaticians. So they need someone down here to assist them to use the machines, and they will lack that uh, technical capacity. And that's why, I mean, through the AI for Africa, we tried kind of to, I mean, uh, build the Africa, I mean, the science gateway. So it is kind of a tool for, I mean, not necessarily for the scientists to be able to know how to co command line the, the HPC, but can they use web two technologies to submit or retrieve the job they, are, they have for the HPC. But also, on the other hand, we, through the WIMA ICT project, we are creating, I mean, a capacity building, a master course in computational engineering, still trying to build more masses on the supporting level so they can support these end, expected end users. So there was a gap. And uh, even today, we have people who are using it but uh, we are struggling to support them because they are mere users. They said, yes, I want to use it, but show me how to use it. So that's the gap. We still have it. OK, thanks, Amos. Yes, Edmund, please. Thank you. Uh, I think in this discussion, we are approaching consensus that sustainability lies in smart partnerships, creating partnerships between the private sector and academic institutions, between innovation centers and entrepreneurs, and bringing in governments to get commitments and oversee those commitments from the various uh, parties, whether they are uh, like social corporate responsibilities from some of the big enterprises that we have. Um, I see sustainability coming through those kind of smart uh, partnerships. And at a regional level in terms of collaboration, I think uh, the value that can be added there is showcasing and spotlighting successes that have happened in one part of the continent in another part. Because I believe that uh, if something is successful in one part of Africa, it is likely to be successful in other parts. And we can benefit from the numbers on the continent because an idea may be good, but if it is in a small market in a small country, it may not benefit the developer or the entrepreneur. But if you take it from Rwanda and put it into Nigeria and Ethiopia, then the numbers begin to speak for themselves and something that was not making money suddenly uh, has a big market to begin to be profitable. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Edmond. Uh, I think this is very important. I mean, uh, it, it touches at the, at the question, you know, the, the market. I mean, our countries are, are quite small, you know, and uh, investment, you know, in, in, in or massive investment in uh, some areas may not be profitable, you know, if the market is not big enough. So, and I think that's regional integration and even continental integra integration is something that is uh, very important. Uh, I don't know if there is any other contribution here from the panel, if, if, if not, um, maybe uh, you wanted to add something? Yeah, yeah, I mean, add something. I mean, 
mean, there was a, something also on the TPP. So I'm trying to see, I mean, how are we doing it, for example? Quite well, I many for the TPP, take for example for Tanzania. I mean, yet we are having the HPC, which is the infrastructure. Infrastructure. Then we have the community of users, but then we have the telecom operators, and we discuss with them for extending the network infrastructure at a very low cost to the end user, hoping that I mean, if we create mass usage, then we can have I mean, a long-term contract. So this is, it, I mean, a, a partnership between the end and the, the private company, but providing the link. In one way, we are fulfilling our obligation that, I mean, we have to, I mean, to save that, I mean, that community of practice who are all over the country. But this guy also, the private company also, is believing that, I mean, once the, I mean, the mass is comfortable with, I mean, using the infrastructure, they, they will be, I mean, a kind of full-time customers for a long time, so they will, I mean, continue benefiting, I mean, getting payment out of using the ring. So that is one way of the TPP. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, may, maybe some, uh, someone has also some comment, because we have 10 minutes left, and uh, several issues have been raised, so we want to use the remaining 10 minutes to give the audience, you know, the opportunity to discuss you know, the uh, issues that have been touched, uh, but not responded to, and make a comment uh, uh, back to, you know, the intervention of the uh, panelists. So I will start with the lady. Uh, my name is Joyce Mamo. I'm working for BVMB, which is an IT consultant uh, company based in Brussels. And my question actually has to go back to what uh, Mr. Gamer had talked about, uh, the diaspora. Uh, I'm Kenyan-American, so I've, I've actually been living in Belgium for two years. And one thing I've noticed is that um, the, the diaspora here is not as large as it is in the States. And I think part of a lot of the startups in Africa particularly have come back from remittances made uh, with people who live in the United States. So uh, my question is, what about the diaspora that is in Europe, not just in, in Belgium, but other, like in the UK, whereby you can create um, partnerships of some kind where it's diaspora focused in the sense that they can be able to also be part of investments and sustainability uh, for company startups. Because I think that's the ultimate starting point is you have people who want, they have the, 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 the nostalgia to go back home and, and help. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I, I think we discussed also the possibility for the diaspora even to contribute from where they are. So, and the infrastructure we are putting in place can support this kind of, uh, uh, yes, this gentleman and then at the back. No, it's okay. Thank you very much. My name is Tony Smith Chiganda from the Czech East African Chamber of Commerce. Um, mine goes back again to sustainability. You know, government support is paramount sustainability. However, most African countries have exhibited lack of transparency and integrity you know, in their operations. How do we uh, handle those cases without uh, limiting government you know, participation? Because we've already seen very many initiatives come up and collapse because of government initiatives or because of uh, lack of transparency and well, uh, something very interesting, and I think the tools we are talking about are very good on uh, mitigating, you know, the lack of transparency and integrity in some countries. But b because you are next to him, yes, very quickly, I want to react very quick. and complement what our uh, Kenyan American uh, uh, person said, because I think it's very interesting indeed to see that for any SME being created in Africa, you find very few ICT-based SMEs in Africa which make at the end of the year break even. It's difficult to make a business, especially when you need to start capital, you may have to count on a diaspora. Now, the Bill Gates Foundation has already for four years organizing every two years a marketplace, which is to give an incentive to African origin IT experts to go back home and start a company, an SME, whether it is in the agribusiness field or in the health sector or in the IT sector. 
I think if there is an advice to be given to the European Commission is to look into this scheme because you may wish to stimulate some IT experts working in Europe to start an SME back home. Because for every SME, the struggle is, especially an ICT-based SME, is to have your start capital. So the idea given there is, I think, it's, it's important. And we need then to know better what are the niches. Because when I see in the reception room, Bjorn representing his small devices, um, the question would be then, if this, those devices and the batteries which he presented, can this now be a niche for an African SME to develop it big quantity? Because I was asking him, Björk, how much is it costing? He said about $50 for such device with the battery. But the more quantity, the cheaper the device. But which SME is going to look into this? Which is going to be the African or Kenyan or whatever bank willing to invest in this? What are the prerequisites to have, make this happen? Thank you very much. So, uh, yeah, there is uh, the problem of financing. So the gentleman at the back. Hi, uh, my name is Peter Kuria. Uh, my question might sound a bit banal now, but uh, one of the things I'm just trying to figure out is that when I look at your panel, I feel that uh, this um, gender imbalance, is this a reflection of what's happening in the industry? Uh, are, you able to, are, you, are, you able to, <laughs> are you able to produce any uh, gender smart e infrastructure, for example? And then uh, the next question to me, which is, uh, which is very close to me, is that uh, I'm trying to understand how you, uh, whatever you're doing, how it's linked to the informal sector, because I believe the informal sector is the center of innovation in Africa. So I'm trying to figure out how you're linking with that and how you're tapping into this sector. Thank you very much. Uh, for the gender balance issue, it was a question for Karin, I think. And, <laughs> and I think that, uh, you know, the, the point is, is valid, you know, how we can all, you know, uh, involve the informal sector. So uh, we didn't want to come back to the, uh, to the panel, but because beyond you didn't uh, have uh, a slot in the, in the last uh, panelist uh, round, so we give you the opportunity to intervene. Uh, I would uh, like to respond to a few things I heard. Uh, one is the, uh, the innovation and entrepreneurship and the partnership uh, thing. And uh, the, way, uh, the way I have experience from is uh, uh, to make uh, partnerships between external project owners, and by external I mean not at a university. Uh, I'm a university uh, person. Uh, and uh, student teams uh, at the university. It could be PhD or master or bachelor. Uh, the more advanced, the more advanced task they can attack, uh, attack. and have external owners that uh, control uh, the uh, the uh, uh, the projects. So the students learn that they have to listen to the to the project owners to get a, to pass the course, uh, if nothing else. And also, hopefully, uh, of, of course, also learn a lot of things. So you have to tick a lot of things and, uh, and achieve uh, 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 some sort of results. That's what I mean with problem-oriented project-driven learning in real projects with external project owners where, uh, where the students get uh, gets, uh, a good uh, start for a a working life. Uh, we have systemized, uh, I've been doing this all my academic life, uh, and uh, we have been working together with other universities in the same way, uh, and actually the Serengeti Broadband Network was designed by student teams with students from different universities doing this. And uh, uh, our commission director from, from, uh, from Bunda District has been part of the project owning team. And uh, it's great to see that it, it has had the impact that we actually see him here at the, at the conference. So uh, the technology transfer alliance is the result of these, uh, uh, this cooperation between different universities. And um, uh, I find that an efficient way. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the Serengeti environment is now developing into a living lab in, in the traditional sense, although 
is not yet uh, formalized as such. Uh, uh, and uh, in cooperation with Costec, there is also the innovation entrepreneurship thing. They run a, uh, a incubator uh, and uh, occasionally actually results from these projects uh, get this way. So uh, I think uh, there are the elements there, uh, although of course uh, 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 it can be expanded. Uh, before you get the microphone back, I would like to mention yet another kind of partner, which uh, is maybe a bit unusual, but uh, it so happens that the second largest immigrant group in Sweden is Somalians. And uh, we have Somalia represented here because we actually have been working together with Somalia in, in, to establish Somali REN, which has been a tremendous challenge because of the sea cable not being able to land until recently. And uh, now it's ashore, and uh, we are sort of resumed the discussions. The Somali diaspora have funded activities uh, where we have been able to ship equipment. Uh, so uh, the diaspora has funded the equipment, uh, and then uh, uh, students, both in Somalia and at KTH, has been working together to design this uh, network. Thank you very much, uh, Bjorn. I think it's also touched, uh, touched on what uh, Simon was saying, that, uh, uh, was it Simon or, or Roberto, uh, that uh, he wanted uh, the students to build science gateways now. So I think that is something uh, extremely important. So I think we are, that our time is over now, maybe, uh, to see if you want to sum up. Okay, thanks a lot, uh, Bobaka. Uh, thanks, everybody, for the input. I will not rehash the key issues raised. We have been uh, noting them, and they have been noted down. They are being carried forward. But I want to make a couple of uh, quick remarks. I, I, I think there is there's a bit of a myth in the assumption that SMEs in Africa are not taking off. There are so many of them starting that women are failing, but many have actually taken off, and, and this is a fact. The other thing I've seen around our continent is that where there is a need, you don't even have to push policy. And I think the mobile sector is the one which has been a very good demonstrator for that. And now computers are also coming up fast. A lot of things happen within the continent, and they're really very exciting. Uh, the problem always comes when we try to push solutions that do not have demonstrated local relevance. That is always going to be a challenge, because if there's no market for it, it cannot be sustained. But those who live within the continent will know the many examples of outstanding success within the ICT sector. Nowhere near enough yet. We still have a long way to go. But I think those are the points to go and learn the real lessons. How have they done it? And how have they grown that industry within the continent? The biggest mobile operators are now interested in Africa, not because they saw the market, but the local operators saw it and started it. And therefore, this should be a very important take-home message. If it is relevant, if it has got value, you don't have to push it. It pushes itself. The pull factor becomes more important. Uh, I want to thank my colleague, Bubaka. He have actually worked with Bubaka, I think, since 2002. Uh, at that time, we were training policymakers and regulators throughout the continent so that we could get a liberalized environment. We got that one. And I think we're now in research and education network. It is a pleasure working with you, Bubaka. Our distinguished panelists, thanks a lot for the input. It has been very useful for the audience here. But especially the audience, your input and sharing are very important. The answers will not come from this audience. They will come when you get back home and actually get working. The answers are going to come from within Africa. Thank you very much. Th thank you to you also, Tusu. Thank you very much.